Hey biologists, Mr. Fawn here. Today we're going to be talking about the properties of carbohydrates. So first up are the must-knows. Complex carbohydrates, these are comprised of sugar monomers whose structure are going to determine the properties and functions of the molecules that they are comprised of. Carbohydrates are also comprised of linear chains of sugar monomers that are connected specifically by covalent bonds. So oh, some few things about carbohydrates are the main function, first off, are to be the fuel for the living organism, additionally can be used for building material. We'll look at a few of these examples here in just a moment. Other things about carbohydrates is that they have to be in a specific ratio. The ratio reads as a one carbon to two hydrogen to one oxygen or CH2O, for instance, if it were to be the imperial formula. So we have to ha maintain this ratio of one to two to one for carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Next up, we're gonna see this word saccharide, and that's how you properly pronounce it, not saccharide or saccharide. It's uh, a fancy way to say sugar. I believe it's Latin, I wanna say. Um, so this word saccharide, whenever you see this, just know that it means or represents sugar. So when we are composing our carbohydrates, we can move from the monosaccharides the single sugars, the one sugars, up to disaccharides, or di meaning two, so two sugars, and then ultimately up to polysaccharides, poly meaning many, so many sugars. So these monosaccharides are referred to as the monomers. If you recall, mono again meaning one, mer referring to the units. We can see a few examples here down below. So we have glucose, fructose, and galactose. Notice how these are all single units, i.e. monosaccharides. Additionally, when we are looking at names, what we want to look for is that OS ending. That way we can identify our sugars, i.e. carbohydrates. There's a few different ways that this could be represented. We could use the linear form. It doesn't quite do us justice about what we need to talk about when we look at things structurally. However, it is an option at which sometimes might be displayed before you. So you'll notice how it's a very straight line uh, from top to bottom, that's the top figure. And what it can actually do is more realistically, what we're going to be using is the ringed structure. So albeit it may look like a straight line, it actually should be in real life, it's, it's folded in this three dimensional ring type structure, uh, which actually forms in this case, glucose that we're happen to be looking at, the monosaccharide. So with these ring structures, what we can do when we're talking about the synthesis as well as the dehydration, specifically we're talking about the creation of these molecules, uh, is that we want to remove the water. So don't forget when we're doing our dehydration reactions or dehydration synthesis, we must dehydrate, i.e. remove the water, as indicated in both of these examples. So we have two glucose molecules, two monosaccharides, remove the water, allow the chemical reaction to take place, and then we're going to form the disaccharide maltose. Again, notice how it has the OS ending. Down below, here's the dehydration synthesis or the creation of sucrose, which is table sugar. So once again, we must dehydrate or remove the water. So we remove the OH from one, the glucose, and then the H from the, suc from the fructose, sorry. And then we remove our water, allow the chemical reaction to take place, and now we form sucrose. So down below, we can see that this is actually, it has a specific name of a type of bond. Uh, overall, it is referred to as a covalent bond. So things are going to be sharing the electrons, but specifically we call it a glycosidic linkage. So glyco, and we could think of as in like glucose kind of, um, and it's linking these together, these monomers to make up dimers all the way up to polymers. So this is the specific type of bond that's going on, albeit it is a type of covalent bond. When looking at our different structures, we can notice some subtle differences. So glucose can change the way that the orientation is in three-dimensional space. Uh, in the example listed here, take a look at the OH that's in blue. Notice the position change about whether the OH seems to be in an upward position or a downward position. This is going to change its structure and allow us to form different functions depending on whether this OH is on top or bottom. Now I know it's a minor change, however, in the grand scheme of things, it has a much larger impact. So we can identify the differences between these two by using some of the Greek letters. 
So the funky looking A would be alpha, and then the B would be beta. So we can say either alpha glucose, which has the OH in a downward position, or beta glucose, in which the OH is going to be in an upward position. Looking at these again, when we're talking about alpha glucose monomer and beta glucose monomers, these are in relation to two of our structures of the polysaccharides ultimately. So when we have our alpha glucose are linked together, we form starch molecules. But when we have the beta glucose, we form cellulose. So these are two examples of some polymers. And all we did was change the position of the OH from being in an upward position to a downward position. The functions of these are going to change drastically. So once we get to these larger polysaccharide structures, like for instance with the alpha glucose, the starch, this could be used for storage of energy, um, such as in plants. We can also have in animals, glycogen, how we store our energy. If you've ever heard maybe a coach or something say you should carve up before a big game or a big meet or something, that's what your body uses to store the energy. However, if we were to use the beta glucose, like for instance cellulose, then this is going to form the structural parts of the plant. Great example of cellulose. If you've ever seen celery and kind of ripped it in half and saw the little stringy bits, like those little stringy bits, that's a good example or representation of cellulose. Another example would be in animals, like for instance, arthropods, and we can see their exoskeleton. Uh, it's called chitin, not chitin, but chitin is how you pronounce that. And if you ever stepped on a bug and you heard the crunch, that's what you're hearing. It's all those beta glucose, it's all the linkages that are then breaking that cause the release of energy as the sound. So close up, here's a few images. We're gonna see these very frequently in which we're gonna see two different versions. We'll see uh, an electron microscope that are usually in black and white, and then we'll see kind of more cartoony versions of these. Uh, this is gonna be a common theme throughout our class that we'll be seeing these two distinctions between what does it actually look like and what is a more cartoony representation of the molecule. However, once again, we can see that polysaccharides, depending on the way that it is linked, like for instance with glucose, alpha versus beta, it's going to change the function. They're also going to function differently within organisms, plants versus animals, starch and glycogen, for instance. Here's that example of chitin. Again, if you've never happened to have seen that before, that's an exoskeleton being shed on the right from that arthropod, and that would be the crunch if you ever heard a crunch from an animal, like a bug, for instance, for stepping on it. Thank you very much for listening. Please let me know if you have any additional questions.